Hello, Wendy Rodrigue here. I'm visiting with you today from the really precious southern Louisiana town of Jennings. And we are at the really precious Ziegler Art Museum. George has a long history with the Ziegler Art Museum. Um, most significantly, his Ioli dinner hung there for many, hung here for many, many years in their former location. But they have a beautiful, relatively new location, the last seven, eight years, and they have just acquired something very, very special. And that's what I wanna to talk to you about today. This is George Rodrigue's Doc Moses Cajun Creteur a hard time saying that word like George did, so forgive me all you Cajuns out there, um, of 1974. An oil on canvas, and it is owned by the Ziegler Museum here, a, a new treasure amongst their collection. You have to come and see it, not to mention all of the fabulous paintings and artists that are represented here at the Ziegler. They're doing some great things in downtown Jennings. So let's talk a little bit here about this painting. Well, George had a real history with the Treteur, I have a hard time saying that like George did, again, um, because his aunt was one. And now a Treteur is a healer, a Cajun healer. Um, some tie it together with witchcraft, some with superstition, some with just the idea of being a healer. Um, being able to use the power of the mind, but in this case, even more so the power of um, family history to be able to heal. Um, each healer could only um, cure one ailment, the way the story goes. It was passed down, but from the man to either, the father to either the oldest son or oldest daughter. So eventually, with that logic, it would die out, right? Especially going on to the daughter who can't pass it down. Or maybe she could, we don't know. So George's aunt was a traitor. Um, her name was Magit. She was the oldest of 11 children. George's mother was the youngest, her baby sister. Uh, Tant Geet was born, they called her, Geet, yeah, Tant Geet, but her name was Magit. Anyway, she was born in 1880. Can you imagine George's aunt? George used to always say that he grew up with the old ways, the old people. Um, that's what was happening around the dinner table, right? When you got aunts and uncles born in the 1800s, and that's what George had, and Tant Geet was a big part of that, and she was a traiteur. Her specialty was healing sprains, and the way that George explained it to me is to heal sprains, she would go to her little book, it was a little prayer book, that she kept her spells in and she would lick her thumb and then she would make three little crosses and i do it this way because this is the way george did it george would do it on his hand like that he'd lick his thumb and he'd go she'd make three little crosses like that and she'd recite from that prayer book now what she she actually did according to george was she'd make those crosses on the sprain whatever that person was. And by the way, the person who was injured did not have to believe. Only the traitor had to believe in their healing powers. Um, so she was a traitor, and we'll get back to that again in just a moment, because there was another traitor, there were quite a few of them around, in uh, New Iberia that was very famous, at the way George would just explain it, who could cure warts. And she could cure warts just by knowing where the wart was on your body. She didn't even have to be with you. She could do one a day. So you could actually like call her up and explain where your wart was. You had to be very precise and she could heal it even over the phone, but not across water. So if you were standing on the wrong side of the bayou, you had to cross to the other side to make your phone call. She was famous, George said. Now the traitor that we have here, the healer, this is one of several paintings that George did of a traitor, but this is definitely his most famous and certainly his first, and I would say his most significant. Um, this is a traitor named Doc Moses. As far as I know, George made up that name, and Doc Moses was a, a healer of earaches. So in this case, he has poured a ring of salt into a big circle and placed himself and his patient inside, keeping out all the evil spirits, right, in a sacred circle of salt. 
And now he's got his fingers on the ears of his patient and is reciting well, from his own prayer book, his own spells to heal him. Hmm. Let's take it a little further and break this down. This painting was a star of the show in 2008 at the New Orleans Museum of Art. And we had a major retrospective exhibition with well over 200 pieces. It was this painting that was talked about the most from that exhibition. How fabulous to have it returned to a museum where the public can see it. It's been in the same private collection since 1974 when George painted it, so, whoa. Um, people saw it for the first time back in 2008 at NOMA and were blown away by this. It was interesting to me because that show, we got nothing but really positive responses, which was so exciting because, you know, generally, certainly at those times, people who loved the Blue Dog series didn't care about the Cajun paintings. People who loved the Cajun paintings didn't care about the Blue Dog series. And I want people to be educated about all of it, and at the very least, come to appreciate all of it and the arc of George's career. And this painting grabbed everyone. But what also grabbed people, I can remember standing outside of that museum show and listening to people as they walked out and as they walked in. And I'd hear sometimes people grumbling as they walked in because they were dragged there by a spouse or by their mom or whatever. And, oh, he just paints the same blue dog over and over again. Or I don't like those black paintings or things like that. But that's not how they spoke when they came out. They were blown away every time by the grand scope and courage and honesty, sincerity that is Rodrigue and his approach to art, no matter what the series. Throughout all of that, and this is the reason I tell you this, we had only one negative comment. And it was a woman who was so upset that she not only wrote her comment, I will never forget it, in the comment book there in Noma, she also sent me an email and it was about this painting because it was about witchcraft and voodoo and should not be around as she put described herself a good Christian woman. <laughs> so I thought I would bring that up because quite amazing what art can do, right? Pull out all these different um, opinions and George actually laughed at that and thought it was a pretty good compliment. <laughs> I would also bring up that his tongue eat was a good Catholic woman and uh, he used to say that she would recite all of her spells and practice them at the same time she was clicking her rosary beads there on the porch. Yeah. So the structure with this painting I think is also what grabbed people in that exhibition and in others. It is broken down into very, very strong shapes, right? We've got these strong horizontals, for example, of these trees, these very, very hard edges, contrasted with, say, this gigantic circle here of the salt and also the horizon line going across. So what could these things mean? Well, George used to say that his paintings, no matter what the series, above all else, are about contrast. So let's explore that about here. We've got the, a bit here, we've got the contrast of, as I mentioned, these hard edges of the tree versus this very beautiful, painterly, nuanced ground. And by the way, y'all, I know it's hard to see on the phone here, but the, this is full of color. George used to tell me, and I always looked at him like, what? He used to tell me that in his early Cajun paintings, his palette was as bright as his blue dog paintings. That's what he said. Now these were painted in oil paint. Most of the Blue Dog series is in acrylic because George had to switch from painting oils to acrylic for his health. But back in these days with the oil paints, that's what he said, just as bright. And indeed, when you all come see this painting in person at the Ziegler, you will see all those colors in here. There are reds and there are blues. There are golden yellows, there are greens. It is full of these wonderful subtleties and richness of color. Mm. So how would George paint something like this with all those colors? Well, he used what is called a mall stick, that's spelled M-A-H-L, um, and what he would do is actually lay that stick across his canvas and then he would rest his arm over that stick. And that is how he would have painted things like these faces. 
was tighter like this. Contrasted with this very loose, fast immediacy of the ground and horizon line. The other thing he would do is he often would spray his varnish while he was painting. So he'd be painting and at the same time that he's painting, he is spraying to keep the texture like he wants and to be able to see what the colors would look like once the painting had been varnished at the end. That is indeed um, what they suspect gave him his cancer and eventually killed him, was working like that in unventilated spaces. So what I think is cool is you can take any Rodrigue Cajun style painting, really any Rodrigue painting, but I think it's easier to describe with just this one piece here to, to limit it to the Cajun pieces. You can take any Rodrigue Cajun style painting and break it down with these little rules right here, I'm gonna tell you. And this is a great example of that. George, prior to painting people, painted nothing but landscapes for three years when he got back from art school in California. Nothing but three elements is the way he described it. Oak tree, ground, and sky. And that was infinite the way he could do that over and over again, oak tree, ground, and sky. And he was fascinated by that. People were not. He did not have many collectors in those days, but he saw it as very abstract. He saw this as very abstract and very surreal. If someone were to ask him, George, where is this? He made it up. It's in here. It's in here. It's a surreal scene from inside of him. George used to say, I am not painting a specific place. I am painting a feeling. He is painting his feeling of Louisiana. So these oak trees, oak tree, ground, and sky over and over again. In developing that, he came up with some really great ideas that stayed with him the rest of his life. And that is, he wanted people to know what the feeling, his feeling of Louisiana was, and how is he gonna do that? Well, he thought about something I thought about today, driving in from Texas here to Jennings, Louisiana, crossing the Sabine River after spending the last two days crossing the state of Texas in its big, giant skies. George would always say that when you cross the Sabine River, suddenly the skies get small. I tested that theory to date. That's not exactly true, <laughs> but, you get the idea, right? You cross the river and suddenly the skies are small because in Louisiana, we are looking at them from underneath these massive oaks. That's how we're seeing the sky. And so how is he going to, as George used to put it, graphically interpret this feeling of Louisiana so that the world knows what it's like? Well, he did something revolutionary that is so simple that no one had ever done consistently in American landscape painting before, and it changed American landscape painting, and that is he cut his tree off at the top. And by cutting the tree off at the top, suddenly the sky is small because we're looking at it from underneath the tree or from between these branches. And also, by cutting the tree off at the top, it is like all of us are under these trees. George has invited us into the painting outside the circle to witness this healing. We have been invited in. The next thing that happens, I mentioned the sky becomes small. Well, what does he do with that? He makes the sky very bright and luminescent in the distance. George described that light as hope. George was descended from four Rodrigue brothers who walked from Canada to South Louisiana in 1755, the year of the persecution of the Cajuns, um, the Le Grand Arrangement. And you can imagine how important that history was for him. And he thought, what would the Cajun people need more than anything else to get from Canada all the way to South Louisiana? They needed hope. Going to a place they know nothing about, scared, loved ones separated, more than anything else, you need hope, right? Hope to find home. And so that's how George described the rest of his life, this light at the horizon of his paintings, this small sky. So that was the first three years, George kept that. And then one day he wondered, what would a person look like 
who walked out from behind one of my trees. There you have it. Doc Moses and his patient have walked out from behind one of these trees and they are locked in to the landscape. George wanted them to look like they had been cut out as with scissors of Canada and pasted onto South Louisiana. They can't move. They are part of the land now, part of the place, part of the feeling of this place. And then, of course, the rules dictate, right, that if you're underneath a tree, you're in shadow. George said, that'll never do. No, my figures are not in shadow. He purposely dressed them all in white with no shadow whatsoever to look like ghosts glowing because his figures are not lit by the sunlight. They are lit by an inner light. They glow from the inside out, perhaps in this case, not only with the Cajun culture, but also with the power to heal, the power of this magic, right? It's magnificent, contrast, light and dark. Mm. Um, the next thing I would tell you about before we get to the end, there's a few other things that I think are, are great to point out here. This frame, this would be the original frame on this painting. That's a pretty special thing. Back in those days, uh, again, this was 1974, George didn't have the money to frame his paintings. He also thinned his paints a lot, which means a lot of his early paintings were cracking. This one is not, it is in excellent condition. But with frames, what he did, framing is so expensive, he would go to flea markets and junk shops and he would buy other people's paintings, discard the canvases, and then stretch his canvas to fit their frame, and then he would actually paint to the frame. So it's the opposite, right? He didn't frame to the painting, he painted to the frame. And that is why this frame so well suits this painting. Because George's color scheme, he was pulling from the color of this frame. And he would have refinished this frame himself, by the way. That was a big part of that for him too. He took a lot of pride in that. So a few other things. Before we wrap it up, first of all, this painting is featured in this book, The Cajuns of George Rodrigue. I've talked about this in many of my videos, but I think it bears repeating here because it's so, so important. So it is featured within. This book was published in 1976 by Oxmoor House out of Birmingham, Alabama. It is the very first national publication ever on the Cajun culture. That's amazing. It is also the very first bilingual book ever published in the United States. It's in English and French. George used to brag that he wrote the whole book in a day. Huh. Every time I got upset with him about that, he would say, but it took me years to paint all the pictures. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, this book in 1976, well, by the way, also in 1976, it won the Best Southern Book Award um, in the U.S. And then also the National Endowment for the Arts chose it as their favorite book in 1976. And they loved it so much that they showed it to First Lady Rosalind Carter, who showed it to her husband, President Jimmy Carter. And they chose this book as an official gift of state during the Carter White House. Whoa. And this painting, along with other treasures, is featured within. And by the way, every single one of these has that same, all those same elements that we just talked about, right? With the figures glowing, the trees cut off at the top, and the light on the horizon. But you see how this all goes black here? The printing, well, it was early days of printing. They just didn't have the ability to do the quality. And let's face it, there is nothing like the real thing. Another reason you got to come here to the Ziegler and see this masterpiece. Um, I mentioned George's Tonk Geet. So we're going to wrap up with a few things on that and then just a very short reading. I promise it's short. So Tonk Geet, as I said, was 
um, George's oldest aunt, born in 1880. His mother was one of 11 children. Um, his mother and Tonky were exactly 25 years apart. And I know all of this because we have a fabulous photograph of all 11 siblings on Tonky's 75th birthday and also celebrating George's mama's 50th birthday. Well, Tonky would have inherited the ability to be a traitor from her father, as tradition goes. It didn't occur to me until I was thinking about this today that this is her father right here, Jean Courge, sitting here looking at us so intently in the Ioli dinner. Yeah, and we did a whole video on the Ioli dinner, by the way. You ought to check that out if you haven't. But I never heard George talk about him as a traitor. So I don't know if that's the case or not, but I think that's worth mentioning and pretty cool. And the other thing I would tell you about her, it's kind of funny before we do our little reading, is that what about her passing it down, right? Well, we don't know if it can come from women or not, but, and the story was too, that it didn't get passed down until um, the healer actually died uh, to their descendant. But anyway, when um, George and his cousins were little, George's cousin, John Edward, was about 10 years old, and he went to Tonky, and he begged Tonky to show him how to be a traitor. And Tonky said, you know what? And he was the oldest, right? And she said, you know what? I will, you're old enough. And um, she said, but you've got to promise me that you won't tell anybody the magic words that I'm gonna share with you, or how to do this. And so he promised her. And all that time, he was planning to go to school and share how to do it at show and tell and show off in front of all of his little friends. She suspected this because she was a pretty wise woman, Tonky. So she showed him, right? Lick your thumb, make your little crosses. And then she told him the magic words. Kakashin, kakakashon, kakashin, kakakashon. And that John Edward, who didn't speak French and didn't know what that meant, he went to school the next day and he showed that to all his friends and he said the magic words, kakashin, kakakashon, and his teacher, John Edward, threw him out of class because there he was saying dog shit, pig shit, dog shit, pig shit, over and over again. I can hear George laughing. He laughed like this. He loved to tell that story. And finally, we'll end on a little bit serious note just to bring it back to the fine art here. Again, as we were driving here today, Douglas and I, he's also, thank you, Douglas, wonderfully filming this for us today. Um, we passed through Beaumont, and it reminded me of George's very thir third ever museum show. It was at the Beaumont Art Museum, which is now, I believe, the Museum of Southeast Texas. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Anyway, it was at that time the Beaumont Art Museum. And they had a director back in those days, um, and his name, uh, I wanna make sure I get it right, Claude, Claude Kennard. And Claude Kennard had a really great Rodrigue show there at the Beaumont Art Museum in 1971. What I found interesting, I remembered this quote and looked it up, and that's what I wanted to share with you, is that he wrote this three years before this painting. And yet, George Rodrigue's vision, abstract and severely linear in its inception, takes form first as a line drawing, then through an obsession with major and basic forms, developing into an elemental landscape statement, austere and sober, limited in color, but rich in range of hues, validly restrictive to the nature of the landscape of Lafayette Parish and surrounding areas in South Louisiana and Southeast Texas, human and architectural features emerge in terms of the dusky world of pervasive subtropical shade where white is exotic and sky minimal. Thank you all for listening. Come and see George Rodrigues' Doc Moses Cajun Tour from 1974 
on long-term view here uh, at the beautiful Ziegler Art Museum in downtown Jennings, Louisiana, and a lot of other wonderful, fun paintings here as well.